Welcome to another interesting episode of Open Book On Location. I'm Katie Poole, the board chair of the Literary Alliance and a passionate reader like you. Now in our 12th year, our all-volunteer nonprofit provides these fabulous conversations with your favorite authors. At our website, PasadenaLiteraryAlliance.org, you can find more author interviews, make donations to the Alliance to allow us to provide grants for literary initiatives, and participate, send questions for the authors, or contribute author suggestions at the Contact Us tab. See you soon at Open Book On Location. Well, I'm really, I'm very excited to be talking today with two longtime friends, Lee Goldberg and Nicholas Meyer. Um, and I thought we'd start with you, Lee, and talk a little bit about uh, the book trade. Um, uh, I know nothing you know about something. it. I don't know why I you know. contacted me. Uh, so what came first for you? You've been, you've worked in television, film, and, and on paper. Uh, what, what came first for you? The books came first for me. I was a college student at UCLA, putting myself through school as a freelance journalist, writing about the entertainment industry for the LA Times, Starlog, Playgirl, American Film, anybody who'd pay me. And I had a journalism professor who wrote those big, bulky, Robert Ludlamesque uh, spy thrillers. I used to call them prepositional phrase books because they always had a first sentence like, the men in the car in the middle of the greatest city in the United States, one prepositional phrase after another. But he, he and I became friends and he would show me his manuscripts and I would give him my opinion about the plot and about the sex scenes, even though I hadn't had sex, I was an expert on everything. And uh, <laughs> one day his publisher came to him and asked him if he'd write a men's action adventure series, which was sort of the male equivalent of the Harlequin romance. They were everywhere at the time. Uh, the Executioner, the Destroyer, the Immolator, the Defecator, the sure. Dribbler, the Sneezer. They all had titles with E-R, O-R at the end, and some guy with a big gun, and women um, with big hooters and explosions in the background. And uh, my professor said that he wasn't stupid enough, hungry enough, or desperate enough to write one of these books. But he knew somebody who was, and he <laughs> recommended me. And I wrote a sample chapter and outline under the pseudonym Ian Ludlow. So I'd be on the shelf next to Robert Ludlum, who's the best-selling author right. in America at the time. Or if they put it under I, you'd be next to Ian Fleming. So. And Ian for Ian Fleming. So people would go, Ian Ludlow. You know, I think I read something by him. It wasn't bad. <laughs> and my book had, which is about vigilantes, had the good fortune to come out the same week that Bernard Getz blew away some muggers on a New York subway train. So vigilantes were hot. New World Pictures bought the movie rights to the book hired wow. me to write the movie, and my screenwriting and television writing career was born at the same time. Wow. I ended up writing four vigilante novels, never got paid for any of them because the publisher went out of business before my, my royalties were due. In fact, over my shoulder here, you can see the cover right there. Uh, that's back when they painted covers of the vigilante novels, and they would change the lower portion to match whatever action was happening in the novel, and the upper portion stayed the same. And, I end up tracking the artist down and getting the painting for the last cover. Actually, it's the painting for all four, but you know, the bottom part's covered over. Well, that's very cool. So, so you therefore wanted to be a publisher uh, so that you could do the same to other no, writers. Publishing for me came <laughs> decades later. And I know and my wife calls it my very expensive hobby. Um, but so I, I've got hired to write the vigilante movie that never got made, but from there, I, I had a, a writing partner, William Rabkin, and he and I wrote a spec episode of Spencer for Hire, which they bought and shot, hired us to write four more, and then I spent the next few decades in television. And to make a very long story short, I was the executive producer with Bill of a show called Diagnosis Murder with Dick Van Dyke. And sure. um, there was a series of books that Penguin Putnam was publishing based on the murder she wrote 
series. And they had done like 50 of them or something. It was very successful. And uh, they approached me to write Diagnosis of Murder novels, which I did. I've left out in the middle, in the 90s, I wrote a few novels that got published that did poorly and didn't make me as much money as television. So I, I stuck with TV. But I, I, I did those Diagnosis Murder novels and that reinvigorated my love of writing novels. And now I've maintained the two careers pretty much parallel. Um, and, and, and you've done other tie-ins. You did a number oh, of the yeah. Monk tie-ins. Um, uh, while I was writing uh, the Monk TV series, I also did 15 Monk novels. But I've done a, a bunch of other books, a bunch of other standalones. I wrote also five books with Janet Ivanovich. Um, I wrote a big best-selling book a year or so ago called True Fiction. Um, so I, I stay busy. I, I tend to write and have published two or three books a year while also maintaining my, my television and film career. So how are they different? I mean, when is one well, better? I mean, I understand, obviously the pay. pay. <laughs> yes, I understand that part. Uh, from a creative standpoint, from a, from a satisfaction standpoint. Uh, well, they're is, two is, very, they're entirely different mediums. I mean, when you're writing a screenplay, you're essentially writing a blueprint for other people to do their work. It's, it's, like, it's like designing a house. You're, you're doing an excellent blueprint and you have a director and location managers and costume designers and actors and all these other people who look at that document to see what they're going to bring to the, to the project, what they have to do. It also has to be an entertaining read. But also the way you tell stories is different. Everything has to be revealed through action and dialogue or it doesn't happen. Plus you're limited by budget and shooting schedules and, and all sorts of other things that impact the story process. And if you're in television, you're working with a writer's room. I was gonna and say. That's, so that's it's a good thing and a bad thing, but um, it's a whole different kind of writing. It's, it's a writing by committee. It's writing with budget in mind. It's writing with shooting days and nights in mind, all sorts of other things. When you're writing a book, you are the director, you are the costume designer. There is no writing room, it's just you. There's no shooting schedule, there's no budget limitations. You can have the Goodyear blimp crash into the city hall. So yep. You don't have to worry about whether it can be shot in seven days with three days on your standing sets and four days on location, any of that. You can just you know, do whatever you please, but that's also much harder. I mean, I can write a script you know, in a few weeks, but it takes me five months to write a book. So the tie-in writing fascinates me because um, our, our other guest today is Nicholas Meyer, who has written now, I think, five Sherlockian pastiches. Um, and much like tie-in, you're basically playing in somebody else's sandbox. You, you're playing with their characters, um, and there are certain things that you can't change. Well, yes um, and no. I mean, I've, I've been a different kind of tie-in writer in that I've only done tie-ins to shows that either I was running or I was on the writing staff of. So in terms of, of Diagnosis Murder, I was the executive producer of that show for many years and wrote more episodes than anybody else. And no one was gonna tell me how to write those books. So it was your, it was your character anyway. I mean, I didn't create the character. I didn't create the franchise Joyce Burdett did. Right. But the books I was writing were my interpretation of, you know, how, basically how I ran that show for years. It was, mm -hmm. it was I was doing my show. And in terms of Monk, Andy Breckman, who created Monk, he was approached to do these books. He said, I don't want to do it, but if Lee wants to, <laughs> and uh, he basically said to me, you have carte blanche, Lee, do whatever you want. I have complete faith in you. And, Marry him, murder him, whatever you want. Well, it was, it was funny because I, I wrote my first um, Monk tie-in and, and he read the book and said, this is great. It would make a wonderful episode. I said, <laughs> because it's already written. He says, exactly. <laughs> Now, the thing about Monk is it took place in San Francisco, was shot in Los Angeles, but the writing staff was in Summit, New Jersey. So if you wrote a script, you had to schlep out to Summit, New Jersey. And I said to Andy, do I have to schlep out? Because he wanted to make it into an episode. Do I have to schlep out there? And he said, no, no, no. Yes, he said, yes, you have to schlep out. But it'll be no big deal. We're just going to do the book as a TV episode. A couple of days before I was supposed to fly out to Summit, he said, Lee, the staff and I have been kicking it around. We want to make a few minor tweaks between the book and the episode. I said, sure, what are the tweaks? He said, what if Monk is blind? He said, that changes everything. Oh, it's just the same story except he's blind. Yes, except he's blind. He can't see a thing. He can't see it. Lee, calm down, it's not as big as you think. It's just a simple tweak. It's not simple, it changes everything. Well, to make a long story short, the book was called Mr. Monk Goes to the Firehouse. The episode was called Mr. Monk Can't See a Thing because it's two different mediums and it, it changed completely. But in adapting my Monk book, 
which was based on the TV series, back into a Monk episode. It was, it exposed to me the differences in how you structure stories for books versus television and back again. And of the 15 Monk books I wrote, three of them became episodes, only one of which I wrote. But it was very interesting to see that back and forth. And there were times when I was writing a Monk episode that had nothing to do with my books. And then I'd go home at night and write the Monk books. And they were two different Monks, two different ways of telling a story. Um, they shared similarities. I mean, Andy and I once talked about it, that my Monk was sadder, a little more tragic, a little more grounded in, in reality. But it had to be because instead of spending 44 minutes with Monk, you're spending 400 pages. You're, it, it, there it needs to be more be the depth same. there, sure. And, and you couldn't have as much visual humor, obviously. It's a book. So you had to have more interpersonal sort of humor and, and uh, character-based humor, uh, situational humor that would play better on the page. Monk is, uh, to me, was always perfectly clear that he was Sherlock Holmes, but uh, did you have those in mind? Or would, did you, do you know the older I, I mysteries? I didn't create Monk. Andy Breckman did. But I, I think he loved Sherlock Holmes. I don't think Monk was Sherlock Holmes. He was a lot more insecure than Sherlock Holmes, not as self-confident as Sherlock Holmes, uh, certainly not as capable in the world as Sherlock Holmes. But the fact that he had his own Watson and um, didn't quite fit into the world he was investigating and that gave him a different perspective, I guess in that way it was Sherlock Holmes. Sure. I mean, well, some of those are just... Um, uh ideal forms of the detective mm -hmm. now and sort of how at least Doyle showed us that those could work. I, I don't try and squeeze everything into the Sherlock Holmes mold, but um, you know, Holmes, Holmes, the Watson character, uh, it sort of really didn't exist before Doyle came along. So uh, it's, uh, except for that guy, Sancho Panza, but he was, he was, you know, he was an interesting one. Um, but so did you study, did you set out to write mysteries? Was that what appealed to you in the beginning? I mean, I know you started with the action books and those aren't really mysteries in a true sense. I've always loved mysteries. Um, I love crime stories. I love whodunits. I love, I love the puzzle, but I also like the conflict and narrative engine that a mystery or a crime story gives you. There's always something pushing the story forward. And if the scene doesn't reveal character or move the story forward, I can cut it. I don't, I don't think that I would be capable of writing something like 30 something or uh, relationship shows or relationship novels would not be my thing. I think I need the threat of violence or the puzzle to solve. I guess I could write medical dramas, but I, I really like the narrative engine that a mystery, whether it's a crime mystery or, or it could be a mystery of, of, of someone's psychological issues, or whatever. I need the mystery. I need the crime. I need that conflict to drive the story hard to come up with the ideas or whatever, you know, I mean, that's, that's why Doyle got burned out after a while. He just said he was tired of coming up with a new idea for every story. And boy, when you do a TV series, you better have 22 new ideas every season. Uh, I actually trouble. find that when you get are in a TV series, you get caught up in the momentum of it because the stories aren't plot. They come out of character. So it's more like what interesting situation could I put these characters into they would re reveal new aspects of their relationships to one another or reveal their, their strengths and weaknesses or really put them to the test. And the stories would come out of that. And I would find that when I'm in the midst of a season and seeing what the characters are going through, it actually sparks new stories. Seeing how a character handled a situation in a previous episode, ooh, that revealed an aspect of that character I haven't seen before. Let's explore that. Well, how can we explore that more? Let's do this. So to me, there's a comfort level in being in a series, whether it's on TV or in books, that actually makes that generating stories easier, I think. Well, so back in the, in the diagnosis murder days, that was really sort of before, I think, we got this idea of this sort of season-long arc um, that uh, we, my favorite show is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, and, and that was one of the first to do a season-long, in fact, multi-season-long arc of, of sort of character. You know, Street Blues was doing arcs. Yes. Um, I think that there have been shows that have done mild arcs over the years. I think that nowadays shows are so heavily arced, you're making a commitment that's bigger than marriage. I mean, I, yes. I, oh, I, absolutely. I have yeah. to make a decision. Do I want to invest, you know, six months in this show because right. I better watch every episode and I better watch it the night it's on or Twitter is yes. going to ruin it for me. Yes. 
I don't like having to make that emotional commitment to a television show. I, I miss the episodic nature of most shows. Yeah, so I, I mean, you know, Diagnosis Murder, Murder, She Wrote, you didn't have to watch the one before to, I mean, you, yeah. you know, back in the good old that. days of uh, My Three Sons or a Father Knows Best or whatever, you, you know, you got the relationship right away and that's it. I mean, one thing, I don't want to date myself and make myself seem extremely old and out of touch, but one thing I miss about older television shows is at least if they were honest mysteries, like uh, Diagnosis Murder was, at least when I was running it, is you didn't have to have a forensic lab in your house to solve the crime. All the clues were there. So if you didn't know who done it, you could rewind the tape and watch the show again and say, oh, I missed that clue. It wasn't revealed during a commercial, you know, right. or off screen or in a lab. I, I don't get emotionally or intellectually involved in a case that's driven by forensics. I find all those forensic shows stupefyingly dull. Well, I might prefer intellectual cat and mouse deductions, right. observations. Those forensic shows are like what, what some people always hated about Sherlock Holmes was that, well, yes, you didn't know, Watson, that that tobacco was only found in the south of Indiana, and therefore that's who the killer was. You know, those are, that's not fair. That's not the fair play kind of mystery. I don't mind a forensic clue that gives the viewer a chance to figure something out. If, the, if they come to you and say uh, the, the, the cigar only comes from Cuba, if that allows the viewer to say, Cuba, how does Cuba fit in? How can you know, it, it allows them to solve the crime without being okay. able to analyze a pubic hair under a microscope? So, have you done long form um, uh, on on screen? Have you done you mean like miniseries, either miniseries or or films? No, I haven't. I've done uh, films, but uh, I haven't done you know. I've done episodic television series. I have not done like an eight episode adaptation of a book or something like that. I've adapted books uh, that haven't been made. Um, I adapted a Western for a network that was going to be a six hour miniseries that never got made. But um, in general, no. Well, let's talk for a minute about uh, the new series about Lost Hills. And uh, that's the first book in the series? Yes, um, the first book in the Ronin series. It was a departure for me because yes. um, my books are, I, I, this sounds so immodest, and I apologize. I think my books are known for being humorous, for being funny. Uh, adventures, particularly the ones I did with Janet Ivanovich. And I wanted to do a police procedural. I wanted to do something more grounded in reality, but I always have to have humor. I can't not have humor in what I, in a, what I write. But what was a challenge for me with Truth, with, with the Lost Hills was taking myself out of the prose. I wanted the writing to be invisible. I wanted to feel more like a screenplay. I wanted the dialogue and action to drive the story not what I was saying in, in the prose. And if there's anything clever in the prose, with the exception of the first paragraph of the book, I cut it. I wanted to keep my authorial voice out of it so that you, you forgot you were reading a book. You'd just be caught up in the current of the story. And if I wrote something that was clever, an interesting metaphor or description, it would remind you you're reading. So if I couldn't put it in the mouth of the character, um, I didn't do it. And, and writing that kind of pared down prose was really hard for me. It was, it was difficult, but I think it paid off because Lost Hills has been the most commercially successful book I've written, but also the most critically success, successful book I've written. Um, it's a terrific book and just, you know, just happened to be about a fire in the uh, San Fernando oh, Valley. No. Uh, the timing was incredible. The, the timing was so weird. I wrote this book and the finale, there's a, a giant fire in, in Malibu in, in the Santa Monica Mountains. And it was fiction when I wrote it. By the time I got the galleys, I was evacuated because there was fire licking in the back of my fence. And I was out at you know, my sister's place in Valencia watching my, my neighborhood go up in flames. And it was clearly weird. your fault, Lee. I mean, you know, having been a showrunner, producer, et cetera, you have the power. So be careful. Yes, yes. Well, I've been dealing with a lot of my fiction coming true lately. I, I wrote a book called True Fiction about an author whose novels start coming true. And just about everything in that book came true about the time the book came out. <laughs> I had the same thing happen with the sequel. And then the third book, which came out a few weeks ago, Fake Truth, I I've been accused in some reviews of ripping off the headlines. It's like, no, when I wrote it, it hadn't happened yet. 
<laughs> and my wife said, why can't you predict things that would help us? Like, yes. You know, what, what numbers are going to come up on the roulette wheel or what stocks to buy? Not what's going to happen politically or geopolitically. So is there some, so I have, I have one important question before we uh, move on here. And that is, is there something genetic in the Goldberg family? I mean, your brother Todd is also a successful writer. He's done, pursued a slightly different career path. But uh, did this come from family background, do you think? Yes and no. Um, my father was a television anchorman on KPIX in San Francisco when I was growing up. So we always talked like this, with the same insincere smile on his face that I have right now, Les. And you're laughing because I've only been doing this for about 30 seconds. But my dad talked like this his entire life, on screen and off. So seeing my dad on television every night did, made television accessible to me. I didn't think it was something I couldn't get into it felt like part of the family already. So in that regard, I was never daunted by what I now know is how hard it is to break into TV. It just seemed like, okay, TV is easy. My mom was a gossip columnist. She was the Paris Hilton of her day. She, my, my, my mother was very beautiful. My father was a celebrity and she was going to all these parties when I was a kid. And a newspaper came to her and said, since you're going to all these parties anyway, why don't you write about them? So my mom turned going to parties into her career, and she did that in the San Francisco Bay Area for decades, then down in Palm Springs, so the Palm Springs Desert Sun. So journalism and, and the media have always been in the background for both me and Todd. We were the first to go the fiction route. They, they were more, I don't want to say parties or news, but they were more the news route. And I thought I was going to go that way too. I started initially intending to be a journalist which is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, how I put myself through college, but... Um, and then went bad. Yeah. What can you say? So, all right. Well, I'm going to talk for a little bit with our other guest, Nicholas, Nicholas Meyer, and then uh, we'll come back and, and the three of us will talk. So, Nick, you are the author of uh, five novels now. Uh, is that right? Have I lost count? Uh, yeah. Five Sherlock Holmes novels. There are, there is a novel called Target Practice, which is not a Sherlock Holmes novel. There is a novel called Confessions of a Homing Pigeon, which is also not a Sherlock Holmes novel. It's not even a mystery. And there's my celebrated memoir. Right. And then there are bunches of scripts and somewhere along the way you jumped the fence and started directing. And um, so how did this happen? Did it, did it start with Sherlock Holmes or did it start with a desire to be a writer? Or I know, I know how you got to Holmes, but not, not sure the audience does, but. Well, I was born and raised in post-war New York City. My father was a psychoanalyst. Um, my mother was a concert pianist. I led an agreeably privileged middle-class life at a time when there was a middle class. My parents were cultivated people who exposed me to music, which is one of my main passions, um, and also uh, theater, opera, ballet, and literature. Uh, I, people said, when did you decide to be a writer? I said, I never decided any such thing. I still haven't decided. <laughs> it just seems to be something that I always did, that words were my familiars. Um, and when I was about five, I started dictating stories to my father that he wrote down. Uh, and then he said, see here, I'm tired of being your stenographer. Uh, you should write your own story. And these were stories about how the dog carried the newspaper home in her mouth from the grocery store, epic material like that. And um, so I did start writing my own stuff. When I was about 10 or 11, uh, he gave me my father the complete Sherlock Holmes stories to read. And I was a changed man uh, or a changed kid. And uh, I started writing imitation uh, Holmes stories, but also imitation other stuff. I mean, I read Hardy Boys, I read 
Nancy Drew, and I read Jules Verne and Alexandre Dumas. I was infatuated with The Three Musketeers, The Count of Monte Cristo, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Around the World in 80 Days. In fact, when I was 11, for my birthday, I was taken to see Around the World in 80 Days. I was already hooked on the Walt Disney 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which I still maintain is the best Disney movie ever made. Um, and when you went to see at the Rivoli Theater in New York, this ginormous Tadeo movie of Around the World in 80 Days, a book which my father and I had read out loud together. Uh, there was a program book that came with the movie. Well, it came if you paid $2. And I, I still have it because I still have all my movie program books from back when there were those. And this was Mike Todd's only movie because he was killed in a plane crash afterwards. But the book was about the making of the movie. And it was about Mike Todd, who had never made a movie. And the article said, you too can make a motion picture. No previous experience necessary. <laughs> made a movie. And it was a kind of sarcastic article. All you need is $6 million and 12,000 people in eight countries, and you can do this. But I was 11, and I didn't know from sarcasm. <laughs> All I saw was, I mean, it's sitting right over there. You too can make a motion picture. No previous experience necessary. So I said to my dad, I said, Pop, I want to make a motion picture, and I'm qualified because I have no previous experience. <laughs> right. And we have a Revere wind-up 8-millimeter camera. So you can, you know, take the pictures. I didn't know what the director was. Um, and of course, the movie I wanted to make was the movie I had just seen. Phileas Fogg, say moi. Right. And I was Phileas Fogg, my best friend, who grew up to edit all my films, was Passepartout. We did it on school holidays, on weekends, on summer vacations, and we spliced in home movies from I don't know where, Paris. And it took five years to do this. And of course, like any real movie, we were obliged to shoot out of sequence. So I got larger and smaller as you put the scenes together. <laughs> you know, in some I'm 13 and some I'm going on 18. Uh, and the difference is pronounced at that age, you may be sure. But that's how I started making movies. And that was my real love. And writing, as I say, was something I always did. I never really thought about whether I wanted to do it or I didn't want to do it. It was grabbing a pen or grabbing a typewriter or grabbing a keyboard or whatever it is we grab now to make words go together was a reflexive action. Um, I was very la late diagnosed with having ADD. And so I can only understand and read something if it starts once upon a time. It has to be a narrative. I can't really read philosophy unless it's coming out of the mouth of a character in a narrative. Um, well, so, so you wrote this little book called The 7% Solution, and that was sort of you know, you just sat down and did it. You sold it. And then you said, I can write the screenplay. When they wanted to make the movie of it, I said, I have to write the screenplay. I, I, I don't want it in someone else's hands, even if- Because no experience was required. No experience. Well, I had already written several movies by the time this happened. So I, I wasn't exactly, um, uh, no experience required by that point. I was suspiciously experienced, but I, I downplayed it. Um, <laughs> so, because the movies weren't big movies or they, they hadn't been made? Were they spec scripts? One of them was a script I, no. Uh, one was a television movie for ABC, uh, which might interest you because it was a movie about the first detective. 
Um, the first detective was a Tang Dynasty circuit court judge in China by the name of Di Zhenjie. And China, as we now know, did everything first. They, they did paper money first, they did coal first, they did gunpowder first, they did whatever it is, they did it first, because they're so old. And so, of course, they did detectives first. Judge, Judge D. Judge D. And um, so ABC, under the mistaken impression that they were getting a kung fu movie, <laughs> hired my friend Jeremy Kagan to direct Judge D in the Monastery Murders, which we filmed at what was the Camelot Castle left over from the movie Camelot, which was on, on what was then the Warner Brothers back lot. And Jeremy gave me my first break writing that screenplay. We had an all Asian cast. Uh, and so that was one. The other was a feature which I don't like to discuss. So, you know, don't press me or I'll have to say, and then it'll be embarrassed. Um, I'll just look it up. And um, so I had done a couple of screenplays and, and probably other screenplays maybe that had been made as well. Oh yes, I did a screenplay about the War of the Worlds broadcast, which when I, call, when I titled it, it was called The Night the Martians Landed. But of course, CBS and its infinite wisdom called it The Night That Panicked America. And it was about Orson Welles and the War of the Worlds broadcast. Joe Sargent directed that. So yes, I had some green cred when I sat down to adapt my novel. So how was the difference? What was the experience like of adapting your own stuff? And suddenly you had a budget. You, you had to stick with a budget and uh, things like that. I don't remember anybody telling me anything about a budget ever. Um, Herb Ross, who directed the movie, gave me carte blanche to write it the way I wanted to write it. What I saw was an opportunity to correct things that I thought I hadn't got right in the movie. Interesting. And one of the problems with taking mystery stories and making them into movies is that the audience who has read the book knows the solution already. It's a spoiler. So when you saw Presumed Innocent, the you know, Scott Truro book, we all know that the wife did it. Sorry for everybody out there. Who, <laughs> it's 25 years later and the truth can be told. So I thought, this is a story about Sherlock Holmes meeting Sigmund Freud uh, to help him deal with his cocaine addiction. And that's the setup. But then they get involved in a mystery on which they are obliged to join forces. And in doing so, there is an exchange of gifts. Freud uh, cures Holmes of his cocaine addiction, and Holmes introduces Freud to deductive reasoning, which plays such a part in his development of uh, psychoanalytic thought and practice. But the mystery was up for grabs, and I didn't think the mystery that I had written in the original novel was all that great anyway. So I kept, the whole process of adaptation was an enabling process as far as I was concerned. An enabling process that would let me figure out how to make it better and how to get rid of stuff. And I was always trying to get rid of stuff. Uh, and Herb was always trying to keep it. Um, uh, you know, I, there's a scene in the book where two people play tennis. And I said, we have to cut that. It, 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 it's diversionary that it stops the forward momentum of the story in a movie while we watch. It's not like strangers on a train while they're playing tennis while somebody's planting the evidence somewhere else. Right. Herb wouldn't let me cut out the scene. He said, no, everybody loves the scene. That was a different kind of logic for me. Um, but you have to be ruthless. 
You have to be ruthless. Whether you're adapting your screenplay, anybody else's screenplay, if you're a director and you've spent half the day getting the most amazing shot, and once you're in the cutting room, everything takes on a different dynamic, and the shot is too long, the shot is too rough, then it has to go. You have to be able to live with cutting. There was a whole speech at the end of the 7% solution uh, in the movie. Because that was the, you know, my first outing as a big time screenwriter and I was adapting my own stuff. And I said, well, Herb, we should cut this speech because the audience knows everything that this man is saying because we've just seen it, but we don't need it. He refused to cut it, refused to cut it. Um, and, you know, Freud has sums up everything we now have learned about Holmes. And I said, you don't need it. Look what he did with his hands. He goes, it becomes clear. And then all I wanted was for Watson to say, you're the greatest detective of them all. But no. <laughs> well, so you have, have now had the experience of, of playing in somebody else's sandbox and making your own. I mean, you, you did that with, uh, with the Trek film. Um, you did that clearly with the Holmes novels. You've been playing with somebody else's characters, but you've written your own novels as well. Um, what, are the, what are the downfalls or what are the, what are the joys of using somebody else's characters? I am a big fan of recycling. Recycling interests me a lot. The first time I was ever in San Francisco and somebody showed me uh, Ghirardelli Square and the, and the cannery uh, buildings that had all been redone, I just loved this. And the idea of pouring new wine into old bottles. Um, for example, I've often likened the Star Trek shows to variants of the Catholic Mass. The Catholic Mass has certain prescribed parts that we all know, whether we're talking about the Agnus Dei, the Kyrie Eleison, uh, at Resurrexit, and so on. Text is the same. But the music that different people have written to these words renders them completely different. The Haydn Mass in Time of War bears no resemblance to the Verdi Requiem, bears no resemblance to the Mozart Coronation Mass, bears no resemblance to the Foray Requiem. They're different. And by the same token, a sonnet is another bottle. There's a, there's a format to that sonnet shape. What can you fill it with? And uh, that's a challenge that appeals to me. I like doing that. I like being able to recycle, to add my own music, whether it's to Star Trek or Time After Time. You know, movies like The Day After, that's a whole separate ball of wax. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of recycling. So you've just written another Holmes novel. Uh, can we tell the title to the audience? Yes, it's called The Return of the Pharaoh. So with a, what did you have, a 26 year break in writing Holmes related novels? Was it that long? And then suddenly two in the space of uh, what'll turn out to be a year and a half, something like that, so. Well, I have to earn a living. Um, I <laughs> are it's sort of recreational activity for me, number one. Number two, I don't write them unless I get an idea for them. In 1992, I was waiting for a deal to close, uh, funnily enough, on another Arthur Conan Doyle project, The White Company, with Francis Coppola, and took a year to make that deal. And I had time on my hands, uh, and I was in Daunt's uh, bookstore in Marlebon Road in London, where I lived. And I saw a copy of The Phantom of the Opera, and I realized I'd never read this book. And in the introduction, somebody said, gee, it's weird that Sherlock and the Phantom, given the dates match up, they don't cross paths. And I thought, oh, I know how to spend the time while I'm waiting for this deal to close. 
and I, I wrote that. And that was 1993. And then I was very, very busy, whether I was doing Star Trek or Fatal Attraction or the day after or time after time, I don't know what. There was a lot of stuff. Summersby, that was another one. Um, and because there was all that other stuff, uh, there was no coming back to homes. But m about, I don't know, 10 years ago, I got an idea for another home book, but I sat on it for 10 years. And that was about homes and the protocols of the elders of Zion. And I sat on it and sat on it. And finally, I just said, you really have to get on with this. I think it was Donald Trump and his endless lies that prompted me to say, you know, I'm a forger. I'm interested in forgery. I forge Holmes manuscripts. I'm interested in fake news. And if it, if it, if you set a thief to take a thief, maybe you should set a fake newser to go after a fake newser. And I, I went after him uh, with the adventure of the peculiar protocol, and that uh, which will come out uh, came out last fall and uh, will come out in paperback this fall. Um, and then my agent, who said, who was so crazy about this book, and it did very well, said, you should do another one. And I said, yeah, like, about what? <laughs> I don't get ideas, or if I do, they stink. And um, he said, oh, put Holmes in Egypt. OK. Said, oh, that yeah. is. Egypt, 1911. Yeah, dedicated the book to him. Well, cool. Well, let's let's uh, have Lee join the conversation, and we'll talk a little more about uh, film versus television and those sorts of things. Uh, that was a fascinating story. I really enjoyed listening to that. I love what you said about being ruthless. I think that is one of the things that separates professional writers from amateurs or aspiring writers. Professional writers are ruthless about their own work and cutting the stuff that doesn't work even when it's wonderful. That, that's amazing. the hardest thing for new writers to learn. I find, see, I, I always feel bad for you guys because I, I do all this research, you do all this research and you have to throw away 90% of it because it's, you know, slow stuff. I, I, I don't throw away anything. I when, put it when, I, when I heard, um, do you prefer Nicholas or Nick? I don't want to. Um... In print, I am always Nicholas. In conversation, um, anything you like. Okay. Well, I was hearing you talk about your, your problems with uh, Herbert Weiss on, on, on the film version of your book. Herbert Ross. Herbert, Herbert Ross, excuse me. I apologize. Um, it reminded me of one reason I love doing television, because the writer is in control. So if I don't like what the director has done with my script or my staff script, I can recut it. And even when the director has been slavishly loyal to what was written, shows take on a life of their own and, and the story changes based on performance and so many other things. I have cut scenes that I loved in the script or that I actually liked in dailies, but when it was cut together, I realized like you did, you know, just the, the hands coming together is enough or the look. And again, I think many people would be, would find that counterintuitive that a writer would actually be willing to cut some of their best stuff to make something play. It was certainly, I mean, I adored Herb Ross, and he treated me so royally. Just to say, you know, he, when I wrote the screenplay, I said, the music is by Bernard Herrmann. It was on the first page. So he went and hired Her Bernard Herrmann. <laughs> had the misfortune to die before he got to do the movie, at which point Herb said to me, whom should we get to do the movie, the, the music? And I said, get John Addison. Uh, and so he got John Addison. And when it was time to cast the movie, uh, and we were really trying to get away from the cliche Basil Rathbone, Nigel Bruce stuff, which I really hate. Um, how do you get someone to look at Watson and not be a bumbling Colonel Blimp and have to explain why a genius hangs out with a jerk? And when I heard that Robert Duval wanted to play Watson, I said, this is a no brainer. This is a great actor. And he wants to do this role. So we got him. Um, and I think I suggested Alan Arkin as Freud. We got him. 
And I had the time of my life working on that movie. It was all downhill from there. I mean, I, I, you're probably far too successful for this to have happened to you. But have you ever had one of your books or something adapted and not been involved in the adaptation? Taking a, a hands-off role and said, you know, go with God. I did once. Um, a, a novel of mine called Confessions of a Homing Pigeon um, was bought by a wealthy producer. And I said, I, I didn't want to, I really rather relish the idea of seeing what somebody else would do with it. And a, a well-known and successful screenwriter who had actually written a movie I liked a lot, had the, undertook to adapt it. And I was revolted. Uh, I mean, it didn't get, it didn't get made, but I was, I was really shocked. And I don't believe, as an article of faith, that, ar that artists are the best judges of what they have done. I, uh, there is certainly, the, and no word definitive belongs in any discussion of art, of any kind. So, Conan Doyle is the finest example of that. Yeah, he was an idiot. He just did, did not, did, he didn't get it. He didn't get Sherlock, for starters. Um, and he may have overrated some of his uh, other novels in place of. Um, so it, it, it seems to me that um, artists are people who sort of put messages in bottles and, and then the bottle goes out into the wide world and somebody's going to find it if they're lucky and pop the cork and pull out something and and try to read what you put inside. But for sure, you're not going to be standing over their shoulder looking at them going, that's not gum, that's gun. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've been hired to adapt other people's novels before for television. I've taken big liberties. And in some cases, I know the authors were not very happy with me for, for doing that. They're never. But, but um, and, and being an author, I understand why they weren't happy. I won't mention the name of this book, but I, I wrote a standalone novel that has been uh, picked up by a, a, a well-known actor and, and they brought in a showrunner and, and I met with them and I, I know they're very nervous. They talked to me about how they were going to turn this book into a, a TV series. And I basically said, you know, go with God. And they, they were like, well, what do you, what, what do we said that you like and don't like? I said, it doesn't matter. You have to make it yours. You have to turn what was a book into a TV series. You're gonna have to fill in a lot of blanks and you have to be happy with it so you can write it every week. Okay. Now, I'm willing to be as involved or uninvolved as you want, but it's not mine anymore. It's yours. And the look of relief on their faces, you know, that, that, that I understood that they're making something different. And it's got to reflect the showrunner's passion or the show's going to suck. You know, it has to play into you know, his or her strengths and his or her voice. It can't be loyal to what I might do if I were turning the book into a... TV series. I think of Kathy Reichs and Bones. Hart Hansen did an amazing job adapting that series of books for television. The show ran, I think, 15 years, but it was not the books. No. And, and Kathy was very wise to say, there's the TV series and there's my books. And she helped make the TV series the best she could and didn't you know, change it. And I, I think sometimes I, it's hard for us to realize that what we write can be that bottle that I, somebody else filled. I did two Philip Roth movies. And Philip Roth's comment was, as long as your check goes through, you're not going to have any problem with me. <laughs> and the other was, I wrote uh, a very successful adaptation of Edmund Morris's uh, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, which I had written for Martin Scorsese. And Martin Scorsese loved it. And Edmund Morris, who is now no longer with us, hated it. <laughs> he hated it. Hey, why? Because it wasn't the book. Well, I, I've, you know, I've been the technical advisor for a couple of movies, and I was sitting on the set one day, and the producers and I were going over the script for the next day. And they, they said, well, you know, we don't think the dialogue really works. It's kind of clunky and this and that. Let's work on it. And I said, what well, are you going to call the writers to come up here? And they said, no, no. They get so invested in what they've written, you know? So. 
I remember years ago, I was hired to adapt William Kent Kruger's novel, Iron Lake, which is set in, if I remember right, it's been a long time, Minnesota. Yeah, and Minnesota, uh, right. In the, in the Native American community, and the hero is a former police chief who, who becomes a private detective or something. But so I was hired to, to adapt it, and we were getting a lot of pushback with the whole Native American aspect and small rural town in the woods, and they wanted to make it urban, and they wanted to lose the Native American stuff. And I said, I, I got a call, you know, William Kent Kruger, right? We can't spring this on him. So I called him up and I said, Iron Lake's gonna be exactly the same, except it's gonna be in a dying Rust Belt city. There's gonna be no Indians. And I talked to him about all the changes, and there's this long silence, and he says, Will it still be on Earth? He was like really <laughs> upset. <laughs> Not pleased. And also, I was hired years later, um, or maybe it was around the same time, to adapt Mary Higgins Clark's The Lottery Winners for Lifetime. It's about these two elderly people, uh, a maid and a plumber, who win the lottery become multi, multi millionaires overnight, and they're outsiders in the world of the rich, and they become detectives. First thing I did was make them two people in their 20s. <laughs> <laughs> just struggling young people who, who inherit all this money because the, the demographics were all wrong. And I remember when I, I met Mary, she was very sweet to me, but she was not pleased. <laughs> she was not pleased. You got to let it go. You just, I mean, you know, or you got to take total control yourself. I mean, this is, this is, and, and, and I'm going to do a conversation in a few weeks with Michael Connolly. Uh, you know, I had a conversation this, this week about somebody who was, uh, in a conversation with about rewriting a script and the script is set amongst historical events. And I said, listen, you got a whole bunch of things wrong here um, that you can't get away with. And he cited another movie uh, which had done very well, you know, 25 years ago. And I said, yeah, okay, that's not me. So if you want my involvement, it's got to, you, you have to color within the line. Uh, otherwise, I don't want to do it. And you have to be able, or at least in my case, you have to be able to walk away, leave the table, leave the money on the table, walk away, walk away, and be able to look at yourself in the mirror the next day. Well, our friend Michael Connolly famously said something after, after that movie with uh, Clint Eastwood was made of one of his books. And people were saying to Michael, you know, how do you feel about what they did to your book? And Michael said, roughly, they didn't do anything to my book. My book's over there on the shelf. You know, it's, uh, and, and, and I think you got to take that attitude. Nobody's made a movie out of my footnotes yet, but, you know, that's, I'll try and be objective. If you look at Bosch, they have taken enormous liberties with Michael's books and the series arc and by making it contemporary, by combining books that happened 20 years apart and making them into right. one plot. And they've done it brilliantly. And, and Michael wisely has been very flexible about allowing them to make those changes. And there are some cases where I think the plot is better in the adaptation than it was in his book. Or it's actually, the original book hasn't aged well and by contemporizing it and changing some things, they made it better. And there are other cases where I think they, they screwed up. But yeah, I think I'm not a fan of the Harry Potter books, which seem to have transcribed, I mean, Harry Potter movies, that yeah. seem to have transcribed the movies. And paste. I mean, you cut and paste, all kinds of things happen, and it happened from Ephesus on down. And that, that is part of the artistic process. If you want to follow where uh, Traviata comes, Traviata comes from the Lady of the Community. The Lady of the Community comes from the novel, The Lady of the Community, which in turn comes from a 19-year-old 19, 19 girl named Alphonsine who came to Paris from Normandy to be a courtesan um, and was wooed by the son of Alexandre Dumas. And by the end of it, she's the heroine of love story. Um, and being played by Ali McGraw. It keeps changing, but it's the same story. This is going to happen. Sherlock Holmes put in the 20th century, the 21st century by those guys. It either works or it doesn't. If it works, you're a hero. If you screw it up, they send you to movie jail. <laughs> well, so- I'm um, in movie jail? What? 
Oh, I'm talking to you from movie gym. This is solitary. We, well, we're, many of us are in solitary at this point. We need to, uh, we need to wrap this up, unfortunately, but I wanted to give you both a chance to talk. Nick, you, you mentioned uh, Return of the Pharaoh um, and its homes in Egypt in 1910, which is, is that, I guess that, that's a fascinating time. Lovecraft wrote about that too, you know. Uh, and, uh, and so that comes out in the fall? Fall of 2021. Ah, okay. And Lee, what's on the table for you? Uh, Protocols comes out this fall. Ah, right, okay. And Lee, is there going to be another in the Lost Hills series? Or? Yes, the new uh, book, Bone Canyon, comes out in January of 2021. Great, great. And uh, they, they, we didn't get to say, the hero of that is a uh, youngish woman uh, sheriff, as I recall. Sheriff. Well, youngest female homicide detective in the history of Los Angeles County. And she's totally unqualified for the job. Which is fascinating. Generates some conflict. There you go. Well, thank you both so much for this conversation. This was great. Obviously, we could have talked for another two hours, but. Well, Nick, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you virtually. Yeah.